I'm going to ask members of the House to be returning to their seats. Be returning to your seats. Members will be returning to their seats and this house will come to order. I'm gonna ask all members to please take their seats. This house will be at order. This house will be at order. M Mr. Doorkeeper. Mr. Speaker, the President, the President Pro Tem, and the members of the Senate await entrance to this House chamber. Mr. Doorkeeper, please allow the President, the President Pro Tem, and the members of the Senate to enter the House chamber and will the messenger please escort them to their designated seats.
This joint session will be in order, and it is my distinct honor to introduce to you my friend of many, many years and a great Georgian, the Lieutenant Governor of Georgia, Lieutenant Governor Cagle. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, pursuant to H.R. 1042, I hereby call this joint session of the General Assembly to order. All members will please take their seats and the Secretary will read a resolution. House Resolution 1042 by Representatives Ralston of the 7th Neal of the 146th and Jones of the 47th, a resolution calling a joint session of the House of Representatives and the Senate for the purpose of hearing a message from the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, inviting each other Justice of the Supreme Court and each judge of the Court of Appeals to be present at the joint session and for other purposes. Be it resolved by the General Assembly of Georgia that the Honorable Chief Justice of the Supreme Court is hereby invited to address a joint session of the House of Representatives and the Senate at 11 o'clock a.m. Wednesday, February 5th, 2014, in the Great Hall of the House of Representatives. Be it further resolved that a joint, joint session of the House of Representatives and the Senate be held in the Hall of the House of Representatives at 10.45 a.m. on the aforesaid date for the purpose of hearing the address of the Chief Justice. Be it further resolved that each other justice of the Supreme Court and each judge of the Court of Appeals is hereby invited to the Hall of the House of Representatives for the purpose of hearing the address from the Chief Justice. Be it further resolved that the Clerk of the House is authorized and directed to transmit appropriate copies of this resolution to the Chief Justice, to each other justice of the Supreme Court, and to each judge of the Court of Appeals. That completes the order, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Sergeant at Arms. Mr. President. <laughs> Justices of the state of Georgia await for entrance into this chamber. Thank you, Mr. Sergeant at Arms. Please escort the Honorable Hugh P. Thompson, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, the Justice of the uh, Supreme Court, and the Justices of the Court of Appeals into the chamber at this time.
Let me call the joint session um, back to order. It is uh, great to welcome all of our guests here. If every member would take your seats at this time. The, um, let me first um, just say what, a, what an honor it is uh, to be back in the house in a joint session and uh, to be with an individual that I have known for 20 plus years and have had a great uh, friendship and bond uh, that extends over the course of that time. I've seen him uh, not only succeed uh, in the upper chamber, but also uh, succeed uh, in the lower chamber. And uh, we are very, very proud. Please join me in welcoming my good friend and my speaker, David Ralston. Also, it's great uh, to introduce uh, a, a lady who has uh, not only done a wonderful job uh, in her district, but also in representing uh, the House, and that is uh, the, the pro tem, the speaker pro tem, Jan Jones. Please join me in welcoming her. And also a, a dear friend and an individual who uh, is doing a wonderful job uh, for many, many years in the Senate uh, as a dear friend. And uh, please join me in welcoming uh, our President Pro Tem, David Schaefer. I would ask uh, also that we recognize uh, and that they would stand the Justice of the Supreme Court, please. Also join me in welcoming the Justice of the Court of Appeals as well. Thank you. And also other members uh, of the judiciary that might be present in the gallery, would you please stand and allow us to recognize you as well? Glad to have you with us, thank you. It is now my distinct honor to um, introduce and recognize our, our Chief Justice, Hugh P. Thompson, who is a native Georgian and a resident of Milledgeville. He was appointed to the Supreme Court of Georgia by Governor Zell Miller on March 1, 1994, and was appointed Chief Just, a Justice of the Court last year. Prior to becoming a Justice on the Supreme Court, uh, Justice Thompson served as a Superior Court Judge in the 8th County uh, Okmulgee uh, Judicial Circuit. Having been appointed to that position, in 1979, just out of high school, no, I'm sorry, by, um, by Governor George Busby. He was reelected um, uh, by the citizens of the Okmulgee uh, Judicial Circuit and served from 1979 to 1994. He served in the capacity of Chief Justice uh, for the circuit through 19, uh, 1987 to 1994. Justice Thompson uh, received his law degree from the uh, Walter F. George School of Law uh, of Mercer University in 1969. Justice Thompson received his undergraduate training from Emory University and Oglethorpe University. He is a dear friend, and please join me in welcoming Justice Hugh Thompson. Thank you, thank you. All right, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Lieutenant, Lieutenant Governor Cagle, Speaker Ralston, President Pro Tem Schaefer, Speaker Pro Tem Jones, members of the General Assembly, my fellow judges, 
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me here to come before you to deliver the State of the Judiciary Address and to report to you our accomplishments and the challenges that still lie ahead. All of us in the judicial branch are grateful for this annual tradition that reflects your interest in and your support of your, our state's judges and all those whose lives are devoted daily to upholding the rule of law. Although the executive branch, legislative branch, and the judicial branch are three separate branches of government, we're all united as one in our service to the people of our great state. I'm honored today to bring you greetings from the state's judges, many of whom are here. They include my friends and colleagues on the Supreme Court, Presiding Justice Harris Hines, Justices Robert Bunham, Carol Hunstein, Harold Melton, David Nymus, and Keith Black. I'm very proud of this court. Also here are Chief Judge Herb Phipps and the members of the Court of Appeals, and judges from all over the state representing all classes of courts. As your Chief Justice, I'm privileged to represent you. And I ask would all judges please stand and be recognized. All judges. I also want to recognize someone else who is very important and very dear to me, my bride of more than 46 years, my wife Jane. I also recognize that uh, Presiding Justice Hines' wife Helen is here, and also uh, our youngest justice, Keith Blackwell's wife, Angela, is here. Would you please stand and be recognized? As you can see, we truly are a court family. Most of us grew up saying the Pledge of Allegiance at school, in which we promised liberty and justice for all. Now, I don't believe we ever meant liberty and justice only for those who can afford it. Equal justice for all is the promise embodied in our Constitution, as envisioned by our forefathers. Supreme Court Justice Lewis Powell called equal justice, quote, perhaps the most inspiring ideal of our society. It is fundamental that justice should be the same in substance and availability without regard to economic status. As Georgia continues to grow in population and diversity, access to justice is a challenge requiring the commitment and the hard work of us all. Georgia's judicial system is sound and is strong for those that can afford a lawyer. But to safeguard its future, we must guarantee access to justice for all people, as our laws are not made for just a few. Too many Georgians cannot afford legal representation, and too many go without civil legal services. Today, nearly 2 million Georgians, or about 19% of our population, live below the poverty line. Their legal needs involve fundamental rights, such as safety for the woman who needs a protective order to shield her children and herself from an unwilling and an abusive husband, or guardianship for the young children of a single dad who is dying of cancer, or education and disability benefits promised to the wounded warrior returning from war in Afghanistan. The elderly have many legal needs involving their safety, their health care, their recourse when they're defrauded of everything they own. I'm very proud of the Atlanta Volunteer Lawyers Foundation 
and the State Bar of Georgia, and the many attorneys in our state who offer their services pro bono or at no cost. But these voluntary efforts do not fill the gap. According to the Supreme Court's Committee on Civil Justice, in 2008, only 9% of low-income Georgians with a legal need were able to get help from a lawyer. Many did not know where to go for help or that legal assistance was even a possibility for their housing, health, or employment problems. In Georgia, two nonprofit law firms, the Georgia Legal Services Program and the Atlanta Legal Aid Society, provide the most comprehensive civil legal services to poor people. Some of the funding comes from interest on lawyers' trust accounts, often referred to as IOLTAN, which they receive in grants from the Georgia Bar Foundation. But since the beginning of the recession in 2007, these interest revenues have declined by more than 90%. Today, there are potentially 13,000 clients for every lawyer employed by these legal aid organizations. As a result, these lawyers must of necessity turn away many desperate people. The lack of legal services is amplified in rural areas. According to a study by the University of Georgia, nearly 40% of the South's persistently poor counties are right here in Georgia. 70% of our state's lawyers work in the five county metropolitan Atlanta area. 62 counties have 10 lawyers or less. And six of Georgia's counties have no lawyers at all. In South Dakota, where 65% of the attorneys practice in five cities, the Chief Justice of their Supreme Court warned that the large populated areas in the state were becoming what he called islands of justice in a rural sea of justice denied. Now I submit to you that Georgia's lack of legal services in rural areas is every bit as severe as South Dakota's, if not more so. We must take steps to correct the imbalance. As a result of the lack of adequate legal services, our courts are seeing a growth in the number of people who are representing themselves. Judges worry not only about clogged dockets as a result of these pro se litigants, but more importantly, about unfair trials and unjust results. Our legal system is an adversarial system of justice. The reality is that poor people who represent themselves often lose. The current president of the American Bar Association puts it this way, Americans without lawyers often go without justice. Chief Judge Adele Grubbs of the Cobb County Superior Court recently told me that the greatest challenge her court faces is the dramatic increase in the pro se litigants in the domestic relations field. This includes divorce, child custody, and petitions for temporary protective orders. Chief Judge Michael Karf of Chatham County Superior Court wrote me a letter saying that the complexity of divorce cases involving children means that pro se litigants are being cut off from justice. With the advent of Georgia's new child support requirements and the need for a parenting plan, many low-income parties are finding it difficult to comply. Our judges take an oath guaranteeing a fair trial to all parties. But as State Court Judge Jason Thompson of Fayette County said, the process is very time consuming when a uh, jury trial involves pro se litigants. Where one party has a lawyer and the other side does not, judges find it difficult to believe that justice has in fact been done. And yet, the resiliency the creativity and the commitment of our judges never cease to amaze me. A few years ago, Chief Magistrate Judge Patricia Barron of athens Clark County created with the University of Georgia School of Law a program that pairs law students with pro se litigants to help mediate disputes in which people have been evicted 
from their homes or sued for other debts. These mediations save courts time and money. The Gwinnett County Probate Court recently launched a pro bono clinic that brings in local attorneys for four hours once a month to meet with pro se parties regarding their legal concerns. Probate Judge Christopher Baller calls the program a resounding success. A number of court systems, including DeKalb Counties, have developed self-help centers providing legal forms for such actions as divorce complaints, petitions for temporary protective orders, and modification of child support. I applaud these achievements, but we need to do better than depend upon piecemeal efforts to plug the dam in a flood of pro se litigants. Equality before the law in a true democracy is a matter of right, said the late United States Supreme Court Justice Wiley Rutledge. It cannot be a matter of charity or of favor or of grace or of discretion. Now, in addition to poor people, those who do not speak English are entitled to justice as well. Georgia's population now makes us the eighth largest state in the country. We're growing rapidly. And just as our medical profession is gearing up for our future growth by ensuring that we have enough doctors and hospitals, and just as our state government is looking ahead to ensure we have enough water, schools, modes of transportation, and trained workers, likewise, the, ju the judicial branch must prepare for the future. We in the courts are as happy and as proud as you and the governor are that Georgia was just named the number one state in the country for doing business. We want to keep it that way. One way to do that is to ensure that businesses have speedy access to the courts for resolving their disputes. Toward that end, my colleagues, Justice Robert Benham and David Namias, are working in the Atlanta area with judges, including Mel Westmoreland, and attorneys such as Bill Barwick to enhance a business court that handles complex business litigation. And we're home to an international airport, the largest in the world. And we will continue to attract individuals and businesses from many different countries. To prepare for the future, Georgia courts need an army of trained, certified interpreters. Nationally, almost 21% of our population speaks the language at home other than English. In Georgia, the Administrative Office of the Courts estimates that more than half a million people do not speak English or they speak only limited English. Providing interpreters is an ongoing challenge in courts across the state. The Lawrenceville Municipal Court schedules a Spanish interpreter eight court sessions a month but they've also found that they need Korean, Bosnian, and Russian interpreters. In the last month, DeKalb County State Court Judge Dax Lopez has taken criminal pleas with the use of Thai, Korean, and Burmese interpreters. Judge Lopez and other judges have found that even identifying the languages a defendant is speaking can be a challenge. Currently, Georgia has only 149 licensed court interpreters, and they speak only 12 languages. Now, that's not enough. Under the able leadership of my colleague, Justice Harold Melton, the Georgia Supreme Court's Commission on Interpreters has increased the number of certified interpreters and the variety of languages they speak. But interpreters must do, do more than simply speak the language. They must also understand legal terminology and their obligation to protect the confidentiality of their clients. As Justice Keith Blackwell, our newest justice, takes over the role of working with the commission, we're hopeful that in the near future, the commission will roll out continuing education requirements to ensure that Georgia has certified interpreters who remain the very best they can be. Access to justice also means giving those who break the law the sentence they deserve. It means not automatically sending some people to prison when their true crime is being addicted to drugs or failing to take medication for their schizophrenia 
or for not paying child support because they've lost their job. Those of you that have been in the legislature for the last three years have built a legacy in criminal justice reform. With the extraordinary leadership of Governor Deal, Lieutenant Governor Cagle, Speaker Ralston, and many others, you have made the state a model for the rest of the country. The Council on Criminal Justice Reform has been ably led by Court of Appeals Judge Michael Boggs and by former Executive Counsel for the Governor, Thomas Worthy. I particularly want to acknowledge my friend and colleague, Justice Carol Hunstein, and also Representative Willard, Wendell Willard. I want to call you Commissioner, uh, uh, Chairman, I'm sorry. Uh, Representative Wendell Willard, who nearly four years ago traveled to Alabama to see how this could be done in Georgia. The stars were truly aligned in bringing together the, law, the leaders in all three branches of government to bring this reform to fruition. It's still in its early stages, and we'll need to be sure we have the proper standards and gauges for measuring its effectiveness. But we already know we're headed in the right direction. One of the crowning achievements is the specialty courts, what some call accountability courts. Governor Deal and you and the General Assembly issued a challenge to the trial courts to increase and enhance the work of accountability courts. Our judges have taken up that challenge. They've stepped forward eagerly and embraced the opportunity to create and then preside in drug courts, mental health courts, veterans courts, family dependency treatment courts, juvenile drug courts, and DUI courts. All over the state, judges have met and exceeded the challenge, putting people on a path to good citizenship, good lives, and safer communities for every one of us and for generations to come. Here's how Superior Court Judge Samuel Eisman of the Alcove Judicial Circuit put it to me. We're seeing lives marked by incarceration and disappointment transformed into lives with promise, hope, and stability. In Judge Eisman's circuit alone, four specialty courts have been created in this last year. In Rockdale County, State Court Judge Nancy Bills is creating a domestic violence court using the accountability court model. Georgia has the 10th highest domestic violence rate in the country. And these courts help save women's lives. I'm so proud of Judge Bills. Cobb County soon will have its first veterans court led by Superior Court Judge Reuben Green, himself a United States Marine. A veterans court also opened up for business last month in the Macon Judicial Circuit. The Douglas County State Court has just started a DUI court that already has 45 participants, including a woman who is addicted to prescription pain medication, whose husband thanked the program for, quote, giving me my wife back. Now, I think that's great, don't you? I do. The juvenile court in Douglas County has two family drug treatment courts and have a special focus on the children of addicted parents. Judge Peggy Walker, who will be sworn in this year as president of the National Council of Juvenile Family Court Judges, says that she considers their greatest accomplishment the birth of six drug-free babies born to parents who participated in their program. Thanks to the governor's support and your appropriation of more than $11 million, by spring we should have 102 accountability courts with more to be unveiled. Thanks to Superior Court Judges Jack Partain and Jeff Bagley, who chair the Accountability Court Funding Committee, more than $9 million of that money has already been granted to local programs. Upon graduation from these courts, now listen to this, this is, listen to this. 85% of the participants are employed. Three years after graduation, 93% of all accountability court participants 
rem remain free from, judge from criminal charges. 85% employment rate, 93% free from breach of charges. The undeniable truth is these courts work. They keep our communities safer, they save lives, and they save the state money. At any given time, there are about 1,100 people participating in accountability courts who would otherwise be in the state prison system. These specialty courts save Georgia more than $20 million a year in state prison costs. As your Chief Justice, I personally thank you for your support of these courts and your partnership with us in helping to fulfill our constitutional mandate. We at the Supreme Court of Georgia have also benefited from your support. Most recently, with the addition of a death penalty law clerk. And I'm happy to report we finally have a full time employee to answer the phones and greet people at our main desk. Our staff is small, and it remains smaller than it was a decade ago. I doubt there are many others in the state government who could say that. When you told us to get me lean, when you told us to get lean, we got real lean, as my colleague, Presiding Justice Harris Hines, recently said. Perhaps we punished ourselves. We continue to play catch up. And this year, we're asking for two more staff attorneys to help us deal with the cases that are far more complex than when I first came to the court. And yet, I'm very proud of the work we've been able to accomplish. In 2013, we issued 429 written opinions. That's 61 per justice. A few years ago, you may recall, that a national study ranked the Georgia Supreme Court as the most productive high court in the nation, and that was based on 58 opinions per justice. I'm also proud of our Court of Appeals and confident that it's among the most productive intermediate appellate courts in the nation. Our opinions resolve disputes among people and inform the parties and the public about our reasoning. That's important because as the state's highest court, it is our job to bring predictability, uniformity, and consistency to the law so that people and businesses know the rules they must live by. We're an open court. We're among the first in the country to offer live streaming of our oral arguments. Whether you're here at the Capitol or traveling in Timbuktu, as long as you have internet, you can watch our court in session. One reason our court is so productive is we have become far more efficient through the electronic filing of cases. Just a few years ago, our court operated much as it did in the early 1900s. But the era of big paper is coming to an end, saving everyone involved both time and money. Soon we will have no more box loads of paper records. Last year, you gave both appellate courts funding to make it possible so that trial courts could transmit the entire court record to us electronically. We've nearly completed that project, and we're close to going live. This will greatly speed up the appeal process. The next step for the entire judicial system will be to design and build a statewide e-file system. The Judicial Council is currently requesting funding to achieve this final phase. Again, I thank all our judges for their patience and commitment to bringing our judicial system into the modern electronic era. Now, I hope you in the legislature know your local judges and the fine work they're doing. If you do not, I urge you to reach out to them because the courts, more than most institutions, have an immediate, direct, and personal effect and impact on your constituents. As Chatham County Superior Court Judge Louise Abbott said, nobody becomes a judge for the money. I must note, however, that other than a few small cost of living adjustments. 
Georgia's judges have not received a state pay raise for 15 years. Let me say that again. <laughs> we got it the first time. <laughs> we judges have not received a state pay raise for 15 years. Well, we acknowledge that nothing will be done this year to change that fact. Please understand, please understand that we need to work together on this going forward. I began today by asking our judges to stand. I end by acknowledging one judge in particular. In an historic event two weeks ago, Fulton County Superior Court Judge Ural Glanville presented to our court and to the Court of Appeals an American flag that recently flew in our honor in the combat zone of Afghanistan. I suspect that most of you don't realize that in addition to Judge Glanville's regular job in Fulton County, where he's been a judge for nearly 18 years, he's also one of the nation's heroes. Brigadier General Ural Glanville has served for 30 years in the United States Armed Forces, both in active and reserve status. Today, he is Chief Judge, IMA, of the United States Army Court of Criminal Appeals. During his three decades in the military, he's received many awards, including the Bronze Star and the Legion of Merit. In September 2012, he was promoted to Brigadier General in the Army Reserve while serving a one-year tour of duty in the combat zone in, Af in Kabul, Afghanistan. While in Kabul, he was U.S. commander and a NATO commander, and he got to know many Afghan judges whom he served as an advisor. Those judges, he said, were very conscientious, but along with prosecutors and defense attorneys, they did their jobs at their peril. Daily, they were targets for the enemy. Judge Glanville got to thinking that those of us who take an oath value how important our job is to the citizens we serve. And that made Judge Glanville think of our courts and our country's system of justice. He thought about how a rule of law dictates our governance and makes us a free society. And he wanted to express his appreciation for his brothers and sisters in the law. So at his base in Afghanistan, he had an American flag flown in honor of the Supreme Court of Georgia and one flown for the Court of Appeals. I believe 100 years from now, these flags will still be cherished by our courts. Judge Glanville is just one of some 1,400 judges in our state. He represents the very high caliber of people serving in our judicial system. At this time, I want to ask that you join with me in thanking Judge Glanville, who represents all the great judges of Georgia, for his service to our country and to other courts. I present Judge Glanville. Thank you, Judge Glamble, and thank all the judges across this great state. And thank you to the members of the General Assembly for your support of the judiciary and for having me here today to deliver this address. May God bless you and this great state of Georgia. Well, let me just say, Chief uh, Justice, that was a wonderful um, state of the judiciary. I don't know if it was simply the content or maybe that slow, deep southern drawl. <laughs> but regardless, it was mighty fine. We appreciate you very much. <clears throat> Mr. Sergeant at Arms, would you please escort the Chief Justice, the Justice of the Supreme Court, the judges of the Court of Appeals from the floor at this time?
Tina. My big moment. I now recognize the Senate President Pro Tem for a motion. Mr. President, I move that this joint session of the Georgia General Assembly be dissolved. The President Pro Tem has moved that this joint session be dissolved. All of those in favor will say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. no. The ayes clearly have it. This joint session is hereby dissolved.